just a few housekeeping notes as we start. I always tell people this when I teach a book, that I do have a mild hearing loss in both ears. I've had that since I was five years old. And auditorium classes are not my friend, as you can imagine, with us being so wide and spaced out. The mics are really a big deal for me. I really like that. Uh, it does help me. But if I say what, or excuse me, or pardon me, or could you repeat that, please don't take offense at it. It doesn't mean that I didn't think your comment was good, but it just, I, I've learned not to just be agreeable up here when you don't hear, because that's not a good thing, because you can get in trouble, um, you know, by doing that. Uh, and I've learned that all in life. So anyway, if I ask you to repeat a comment, uh, just, just understand that. Uh, that's where that is uh, coming from. So the uh, book of Ezekiel, how many people have studied the book of Ezekiel before in class? I am blown away by that. Really? I think in my lifetime, I only remember one time that I've been in the class where Ezekiel has taught, and that was here. That was here one time before. John Murphy taught it. That's the only time I can remember ever studying the book of Ezekiel. Um, and so I'm just really excited that a lot of you all have studied it before, but uh, it's surprising to me. And I think Ezekiel, like many books, is a book that we often have neglected. But I think it's a very, very important uh, book. Um, what things, I mean, why, why would Ezekiel be important, other than the fact that it's in the Bible and, and it is a revelation of God's mind and God's work? But uh, can you think, get, why do you think Ezekiel would be really, why is it important to understand the book of Ezekiel? Particularly for us in the New Testament era, I have, I have a leading thought. Why, why do we need to understand the book of Ezekiel? We've got the New Testament. Yeah. So I'll repeat what Mary said, um, but she said basically you know, really to understand certain books of the Bible, particularly the book of Revelation in the New Testament, you've got to understand the book of Ezekiel and a book of Daniel. And that is true. You know, we very much, how many people sit there and say, I really want to study the book of Revelation. I really want to understand the book of Revelation. Okay, have you studied the book of Daniel? Have you studied the book of Ezekiel? And a lot of times the answer is no. Well, if you're going to study the book of Revelation, you can't start in Revelation. You've got to understand Ezekiel and other books of the Old Testament to understand this because the literary genre is, is very similar. We'll talk about that in just a, a second. But I, I read somewhere or heard somewhere, and I didn't verify if this is true, didn't count it up, but there are something like 95-plus similarities, wording and otherwise, from Ezekiel to Revelation. So, again, to understand Revelation, you're going to have to understand the book of Ezekiel. Aaron? Well, Isaiah and Jeremiah, well, Jeremiah, his contemporary, was the prophet to the fallen nation of Judah. Ezekiel is the prophet to the remnant. Right. And we are described as the remnant. Ezekiel is relevant to us because Ezekiel is prophesying to the same kind of people that God has made us into. And while Jeremiah is still a relevant prophet to our interests, his primary interest was in saving who could be saved from a nation of people that were fallen. That doesn't describe us as much as a remnant. Yeah, I think, um, I think that Ezekiel, a lot of what he has to say is very applicable to us. I think Ezekiel talks about us. Uh, I think in his prophetic vision, uh, I think he has a lot to say about what God is going to do and accomplish uh, in the New Testament era, and I think that that's very, very important for, under, for us to understand. Ezekiel falls in a class of literature that some people describe, or many scholars describe it as apocalyptic literature. Has anybody heard that term before, apocalyptic literature? See, some yeses, some noes. So I, I tried to look up what a definition of it is, and you go out to the Internet, 
And of course, the internet always is a mixed bag. Sometimes you get good things and sometimes you get bad things, even from supposedly reliable sources. For instance, uh, if you go to Britannica, definition of apocalyptic literature, it's terrible. It says, it foretells supernaturally inspired cataclysmic events that will transpire at the end of the world. That is not the definition of apocalyptic literature, but that is a common definition that people use. Uh, And the biggest problem with Britannica's definition is the last part of it when they say end of the world, uh, describing events that are at the end of the world. That's an interpretation, not... um, not really a definition of what apocalyptic uh, literature is. But a couple of definitions that I did find that uh, I liked is, here's one, it says that it's a narrative account of a, rev- a re- uh, excuse me, a narrative account of a revelatory experience involving a visionary and an otherworldly interpreter. So apocalyptic literature is a narrative account of a revelation. Uh, And it usually involves visions uh, and some interpretation uh, to that. And uh, I think that's a good definition of apocalyptic literature. Another definition is sudden divine intervention in human history for the accomplishment of either salvific or judgmental purposes. Uh, And I think that's a good definition of apocalyptic literature. And from those definitions, we can see that apocalyptic literature is often highly figurative, It can be hard to understand because it uses strange and sometimes bizarre imagery in our mind. Uh, And we don't have to go very far than the first chapter of Ezekiel to be blown away by a a vision. And we'll get to that next week. But some people described it, I mean, as talking in code language. And so from that, you can see that uh, you can see, I think, and understand there are certain books that would fall into that. Uh, particularly the last half of the book of Daniel is considered apocalyptic literature. Ezekiel is considered apocalyptic literature. There are some prophets like uh, Zechariah um, that are, are considered you know, apocalyptic. And of course, in the New Testament, uh, portions of the Gospel of Matthew are considered apocalyptic more than anything, but most commonly the book of Revelation is considered apocalyptic literature. I mean, it's written, uh, it involves a lot of figures, uh, and can involve imagery that sometimes that we consider strange and bizarre but have meaning, and sometimes it can be difficult to understand. And because of that, apocalyptic literature we often neglect, uh, which is why when about it looked like about half of you had raised your hand that you'd say the book of Ezekiel before, I was, I was blown away by that. I think that's a good thing. But I was blown away by it mainly because Um, I think, like the book of Revelation that we don't often study in class, Ezekiel's one of those books that we're like, well, I don't exactly know what he's talking about here. Uh, You know, some of it I understand, some of it I don't. Um, Same with Revelation, and therefore we often don't talk about it. But uh, anyway, I hope that from this quarter you'll have a good understanding of the vision and the book of Ezekiel that he sees, and that will help you going forward as you study other books Um, particularly the book of Revelation. So this morning we're going to talk about the first three verses here. Might be one of the few times that we read our material, but turn with me to Ezekiel 1. Let's read that together. It says, In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kibar Canal, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kibar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So as we study the book of Ezekiel and as we do our introduction to it, uh, I very much want to give you some background material, things that we need to understand that was going on this time of the world, uh, particularly involving Judah, uh, but things that were happening and occurring here in this time of the world, because I think that you need to understand these events to understand uh, Ezekiel. And so I I pretty much wanted to review those. 
So, um, if you will, for just a minute, turn over to 2 Kings 22-25. Just kind of have you there. We'll look, uh, we'll look there for a little bit to understand the events that were going on at this time. So, Ezekiel starts in Ezekiel 1 that says, In the 30th year... Now, most people believe that he's talking about in the 30th year uh, that he's talking about uh, his, his life. He is in his 30th year of life. Um, and so from that, we can date specific things as far as uh, what happened. Some people think that it refers to uh, 30 years since the book of the law was found since Hezekiah. But that's actually very convenient because when, I'm not Hezekiah, I'm sorry, Josiah. But that's very convenient because uh, basically when those events happen uh, right around uh, the same time. But most scholars believe that when he talks about in the 30th year, he's talking about in his life. In his 30th year, um, that, you know, this, he first received um, this vision. So if we go back and look and start just kind of looking through the events that were occurring in the, um, in, the, in the kingdom of Judah at this time, uh, I think that kind of sets our background. And I set, I set this in kind of a, a slide format. But if we look at around 640 or 639, I mean, there, there can be discrepancies of a year or so, Josiah begins to reign. Now, Josiah is Manasseh's son. What do we know about Manasseh? The what? He was bad, all right? His king was bad. Manasseh was actually bad until the end of his life. And what people often don't remember, because really when the Lord describes Manasseh, um, I mean, he describes him as a king like no other. The evil that he took Judah into is basically described as uh, not like anything before him, not even like what uh, Samaria had done. Uh, Manasseh was described as being that evil. Now, Manasseh is, uh, I believe he's Hezekiah's son. Now, Hezekiah was considered one of the better kings. And so you sit here and think, okay, we had such a godly king in Hezekiah that led the people of Israel in, uh, in a great way, yet uh, he has a son, Manasseh, that takes the people of Israel, I'm sorry, the people of Judah, far away from uh, serving God. Uh, and so idolatry becomes rampant. There are just many, many things that Manasseh uh, involved, except at the end of his life, God humbles Manasseh. And Manasseh actually turns back to God. And at the very end of his life, Manasseh is described as being good, but in terms of his influence on the kingdom of Judah, he's not able to reverse that. Uh, he's put Judah on a path that he can't, uh, he doesn't change. And you'll see some of his successors will not be able to change ultimately in the long run, such that when it comes time for God to judge the nation of Judah, he frequently says it's because of the sins of Manasseh. And he doesn't say, well, he's just, it's where Manasseh took you and where you went. So Manasseh is one of the most evil kings for uh, most of his reign that Judah had, yet we have Josiah, who is Manasseh's grandson, comes to the throne, and Josiah is known because he comes to the throne. How old is he when he comes to the throne? He's eight. He's, he's young. Uh, and then it says when Josiah turns 16, so eight years into his reign, uh, is a beautiful statement about Josiah. What does it say? When he's 16 years old, he began to seek the Lord. So Josiah, unlike his predecessors, starts to seek after God. Uh, and he begins to change things in terms of Judah. But ultimately, what, what Josiah is going to figure out, or he doesn't figure it out, but what's going to happen is, even though he can force the people to do right things, he doesn't always change their heart. And, and they're going to quickly relapse. So Josiah comes to reign around 640, around 639. But there's an event that happens in his 18th year of his reign that is a profound event. And uh, I mentioned it earlier, but you all remember, what was that event that happened? 
Yeah, they found the book of the law in the temple, and they read it before Josiah, and he's just like, I mean, we're doomed. We're in trouble. And so it really spurs on a revival of sorts, and, um, and things change. And, and it says they celebrate a Passover like it had never been you know, celebrated before. So they get back to celebrating uh, the Passover, remembering the Passover, keeping that, and back to uh, serving God. And so the book of law was found, well, coincidentally, uh, around that same time was when the prophet Ezekiel was born. Uh, around 622, 621 uh, B.C. is when Ezekiel is born. What ends up happening with Josiah? How does he die? In battle. Uh, so he dies around 609, 608 B.C., in a battle that he has with Pharaoh Necro. So Pharaoh Necro out of Egypt is actually going up to attack Babylon because Assyria is crumbling, Babylon is growing in power, and Babylon is attacking Assyria, and Pharaoh Necro is actually going up to aid Assyria because they want to put down Babylon because of their growing power. But how would Egypt get up to where Babylon is to fight? Where do they have to go through? What land? Palestine, right? They've got to go through the land of Judah, the land of Israel, to get there. And so Josiah doesn't like that, and he goes to cut off Pharaoh Necro, Necho in uh, this. Uh, sometimes he's called Necho, sometimes he's called Necro. Um, but he goes to cut him off in battle because he doesn't. He, he wants to... And it says he becomes a hindrance to Pharaoh Necro. So there's a battle that occurs here, and Josiah dies in the battle. He's wounded by the archers, and they take him out, and ultimately he dies. But it's interesting that Pharaoh Necro tells Josiah, why are you coming against me? I have no trouble with you. I'm not here to attack you. And it says it was by the word of the Lord that that message was delivered to Josiah, that Necro said that, but Josiah uh, attacks anyway, and he does impede Pharaoh Necho, but uh, he dies in uh, battle. And so when he dies, then Jehoahaz, his son, comes to the throne. But Jehoahaz, uh, as you see in 2 Kings, he reigns for just a very, very short time. Because presumably, I uh, guess what he does, does not set well with, the, with Pharaoh Necho. And Pharaoh Necho actually puts him in chains and takes him to Egypt and when he does that uh, he then makes Jehoiakim who is another one of Josiah's son he Pharaoh Necho puts Jehoiakim on the throne and so uh, he rises to power and Jehoiakim um, is in he is king when Daniel is going to be taken here in just a second uh, that I'm going to mention uh, he is the one who is ruling. So Pharaoh Necro basically puts one of Josiah's sons on the throne who's going to be loyal to him. Uh, and so Jehoiakim arises uh, to the throne. However, approximately three years in or so, then uh, that's when Nebuchadnezzar, in this battle at um, um, it's Carchemish or something of that nature. But anyway, that's where the, the famous battle occurs in 605, and that's when Nebuchadnezzar, who's not yet ruling, he is the general at the time. His father dies shortly after that, and he ascends to the throne of Babylon. But he is the general. He defeats Assyria. He defeats Egypt, consolidates his power around 605 uh, B.C., and uh, because of that, he will actually take some hostages, and some people call them the first wave of captives, but they're mainly uh, nobility that he's going to take out of uh, Israel, uh, Judah excuse me, and take to Babylon. And in that first wave, that's where we see Daniel and his friends are taking. Again, they're the ruling class in, in uh, Judah, and they're taking away and I think Nebuchadnezzar is doing this because he's trying to enforce some kind of loyalty on uh, Judah onto uh, Babylon, to, to have towards uh, Babylon. 
And if you look over in Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, he says it's in the third year of Jehoiakim that he and his friends were carried uh, captive. Now, just as a side note, who does Daniel prophesy to? Does he prophesy to the people? This kind of gets back to what the Aaron says. No, actually, Daniel testifies to Nebuchadnezzar and the leaders, right? He's in nobility. So the people that he's influencing are the leaders in uh, Babylon. So you have God testifying to, um, to uh, events in his working in the world to Nebuchadnezzar and those that follow him, the leaders of, um, of Babylon and then the leaders of the Medes and the Persians. You have Daniel and his friends testifying to them because they're in the ruling order um, and, and because of that. And so uh, I think it's, it's going to be pretty neat about how God's going to be delivering his word. So we've got one portion that's delivering his word to the leaders on the events that occur. Well, Jeho Jehoiakim doesn't, um, doesn't take him long before he's had enough of Babylon, and so he basically tries to appeal to Egypt again to help him as one person um, but Egypt is not a power anymore, um, and, and that's, some of that's going to be prophesied here in uh, Ezekiel. But uh, he will actually die in a rebellion against uh, Babylon, and uh, because of that, then his son, his son is Josiah's grandson, Jehoiachin, then comes to power, but he, doesn't, he does not uh, stay in power for very long, because when Jehoiachin comes to power, Nebuchadnezzar puts that down, and Nebuchadnezzar takes Jehoiachin to, um, to Babylon, along with uh, the second wave of captives, and this includes Ezekiel. Uh, and as we read in the, in the first chapter, um, it, it basically says it was in the fifth year of his exile that Ezekiel will start to prophesy. So we, don't, we can date some of these things uh, by Ezekiel in the events that he uh, mentions. So the second wave of captives is carried to Babylon. That includes captives and most of the artisans. Basically what Nebuchadnezzar now is left behind in Babylon. He's taken the ruling class. He is taking uh, Ezekiel, who is, a, who is a priest, and many of the artisans all the way. He's mainly left the impoverished people to, fend, uh, to uh, Judah. And that is what's left. But Nebuchadnezzar then places Zedekiah on the throne when he takes Jehoiachin into exile. Now, Zedekiah is Josiah's son. He's Jehoiachin's uncle who then uh, reigns. And um, it's not very long, you know, roughly uh, 10 years or so before Zedekiah has had enough of Babylon. And he is going to, he is going to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to siege Babylon again, so yet a uh, third time that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come up. What happens to Zedekiah? Do you remember what happens to him? How does he escape? Or does he escape? Yeah, he actually digs out, right? And it's going to be talked about here in Ezekiel. But he digs out and he flees, but he's caught by um, Nebuchadnezzar. He's caught by the, the people of Babylon. And what is, what is Zedekiah's fate? Does he die right then? He doesn't. What, what do they do to him? They, they put his eyes, what do they do for him? They put his eyes out. They kill all his sons before him. And then they put his eyes out. So the last thing that he saw in his life was his sons being executed before him. And his eyes are put out. And actually, Ezekiel is going to speak to that. Uh, before we get there, he's going to say, your prince is going to be carried to Babylon, but he's never going to see Babylon. Like, well, what does that mean? Well, he's prophesying ahead of time what happens. Well, that's, that's the fate that ends up with uh, Zedekiah. But right around the fifth year of Jehoiachin's exile, so about the fifth year of Zedekiah's reign, Ezekiel begins his uh, ministry to the people. He's age 30. Now, there is some significance with the fact that Ezekiel is 30 years of age, because who is Ezekiel? What did it say back in the first chapter? It described him as, as what? He was, what was he going to be before he was carried into exile? He was going to be a priest. And so he has spent all his life training to be a priest. And we think about this, 
you know, being a priest was much more than understanding the law. Uh, understand that all the things the priests had to, had to learn to do. They had to learn, uh, you know, they were the one that slaughtered the animal for the sacrifices. There was a, a specific technique in certain things that they had to do um, when they did that because it had to be done properly to be um, prepared. So he has spent all his life learning all of these things that it takes to be a priest, including uh, would have to be learning the law because he has to be a teacher to that. So at the time that Ezekiel is to become a priest, there's no more, there's, he's, no long, he's no longer there. The temple's still standing, at least for a moment, but he is not in uh, Jerusalem where he can function as a priest. Well, when Zedekiah rebels, that's 587, 586, that's when Nebuchadnezzar comes uh, again, Babylon, and they siege Jerusalem and this time they level Jerusalem. They level the temple. It's burned. It is destroyed. Zedekiah is deported, and all the final captives that Babylon will take uh, that will take back to Babylon are uh, deported. Around 572 or 571, we have Ezekiel's last recorded prophecy, and that we find in Ezekiel the 40th chapter. There it says it's in the 25th year of Jehoiachin's exile. Uh, so doing you know math, starting five years, uh, he was 35 years into the exile. That makes him about 50. And again, I think there's some significance to that. Uh, anybody? What's the significance of the fact of him being 50? Anybody, anybody know? Priest retired. That's right. So. Uh, and you have to look in, uh, see, I wrote it down. Numbers, the fourth chapter, and you look at it. But basically, if you look at the Levites and you look at the priests, they served as a priest from age 30 to age 50. When they were 50, that's when they were no longer uh, put into service and retired from the service. So what we're going to find out, this book of Ezekiel is going to detail what, uh, what uh, Ezekiel does and how he spends his life. So instead of 20 years of spending his life as a priest, uh, like he had planned to do and was des or was going to do, um, he's going to spend his 20 years being a prophet and ministering to uh, the people. I think, um, as Aaron mentioned earlier, then significant to note. So Ezekiel is in exile. He's very much of the prophet to the exiles, right? Jeremiah is the prophet to the people uh, back in Babylon because uh, Jeremiah never goes to Babylon. But do you think, knowing what we just went through, Jeremiah would have been a tremendous influence on Ezekiel, if you think about it? Because Ezekiel, most of his life, up until he starts prophesying, he spent in Babylon. Those are all the years that Jeremiah is prophesying very likely that Ezekiel has recollections of hearing and seeing in person Jeremiah prophesying to the people about what's coming before he's carried uh, captive. So keep that in mind. I think that's a very important um, you know, background thing. And then in 536, the uh, captivity in. So as a theme for the book of Ezekiel, look over in Ezekiel 36 chapter, verses 22 through 23. I put this as a theme kind of for the whole book. But there Ezekiel says, God says through Ezekiel, he says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus say the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So there's a couple of things that are in this passage. This passage is talking about the restoration, the future restoration that God's promised, and we'll get to that. But a couple of things that, that I think are very, very important uh, when he talks about restoration, when he talks about this book, God acting in the world is very much not about us. You know, I think sometimes we want to think, 
And this even gets to Jesus coming and living for us and dying for us. Yes, he saved us. Yes, that was gracious. Yes, we're grateful for that. But it wasn't because of us that God did it. It's because of what he's talking about here. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. I will be shown to be holy. It's my great name that is going to be uh, broadcast or going to be spread through the world. And so when we see God acting in the world here in the book of Ezekiel and really all through it, it's really about the holiness of God, the great name of God. It's not about us. We're the beneficiaries of it. But he's, he's, say, he's telling them, look, I'm not doing this, you know, it's not for your sake. This is about me and what I rightfully deserve, my great name that should be, um, that should be glorified among the nations and among the world. And, you know, I think about in our summer series, um, I'm sorry, his name just went me, but it was a really profound thing that he said in the book of 2 Timothy. Um, I don't think of his name. I know uh, he preaches at Castleberry, but anyway. But you remember when he talked about that, when he said, look, when God created the world, he made man in his image. He was to populate people that were the image of God. But then we messed that up. But then he, he called out the Israelites. Why was that? Because they were show forth the image of the God. But they messed that up, right? They were supposed to fill the world with God's image, but they messed that up. Now we have Christians who very much um, receive the Spirit of God, which we'll talk about that. But really, what is our goal? What is our purpose? It is to spread the world with the image of God, to show forth the image of God. That's what God is saying here. Um, he is saying that really God acting in this world is all about his great name. We're just the beneficiary of that. But the second thing that I think is very thematic here from this that you'll see throughout the book of uh, Ezekiel is he says, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. Pay attention to that as you read through the book of Ezekiel. How many times he says, then you will know that I am God. Or this is going to happen to Egypt, and then Egypt will know that I am God. Or this is going to happen to you know, Tyre, all these other nations that he prophesies against some in Ezekiel, then they will know that I am God. Uh, and when Ezekiel begins to prophesy, he says, then the people will know that there is a prophet of God among them. You will know that I am God. So the things that are happening when he prophesies for it in the future, when it occurs and takes place, uh, that is, again, a testimony to who God is. And from that, we can strengthen our faith knowing that the Lord uh, has acted and continues to act and continues to act uh, on, um, to, you know, in, in his, to accomplish his will, he continues to act uh, today. But these are the things that strengthen our um, faith. So in, in James, the fifth chapter, verses 10 through 11, There, James is talking about, he's, he's written this epistle to Christians who are suffering. But he makes the statement. That. Um, in the fifth chapter, he makes the statement to them in verses 10, he says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But I like that passage because he says, um, as an example of suffering and patience, consider the prophets. I think many times when we look back in um, the Old Testament and we see these people of faith, we don't see them at our level. We kind of see them more as superheroes. And I hope as we go through the book of Ezekiel that you're going to see Ezekiel as a guy like us. Uh, and you're going to see him really at our level and draw strength from that. Um, Ezekiel's name means God strengthens. Um, and so as we go through the book, I want us to pay particular attention to that because Ezekiel's going to, have some, going to go through some hard times. 
uh, as a prophet of God and speaking the things that people aren't going to like to hear. But his name itself means God strengthens. So let's look through the book and think about how does God accomplish that? How does God strengthen Ezekiel? And what's in that for us? How can God uh, accomplish that? Um, and Ezekiel, um, you know, and I listed some verses there, really talk about what he was called to do. He talked about in the second chapter uh, that he was going to be a prophet. In the third chapter and in the 33rd chapter, he's called to be a watchman. Uh, in, in other words, to, um, to watch out for the house of Israel and warn the house of Israel. And we'll spend more time talking about that. Uh, I just want to mention briefly, I've got some passages listed here that I think they go together about a prophet. What, what is a prophet? Pretty basic. It's a spokesperson for God, right? Someone who speaks for God. Not necessarily everything that a prophet speaks is about the future, but it can be. So many times he can reveal things that uh, are going to happen often years or even many years before they happen. And in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, God tells the children of Israel, how is it that you know someone is a prophet? Yeah, what, what they say comes true, then you will know that they are uh, my prophet. And when they, what they said doesn't come true, then they have not spoken uh, by me. In Micah, the third chapter, verses 11 and 12, uh, there he talked about how the prophets were taking it for gain. So in other words, they were not speaking for God. They were, um, they were taking uh, money for the things that they were saying. He said, Jerusalem is going to be plowed like a field. Well, Jeremiah quotes from Micah, the prophet, in verse 26 uh, in 16 through 19. Uh, he talks about in the time of Hezekiah that uh, basically the people during the time of Hezekiah, listened to God and repented, and God relented of the disaster that he had planned for Jerusalem. And do you remember at the end of Hezekiah's life, though, remember Hezekiah gets sick, he prays to God, humbles himself before God, God spares him, says, I'm going to give you 15 more years, but then Hezekiah becomes a little bit arrogant, and there are envoys that come to Judah from what country? Babylon. And what does Hezekiah show them? The treasure of the temple. He takes them in the temple, shows them everything. All the money that they have. And, uh, and they go to Hezekiah and say, why did you do that? Well, because of that, Babylon's go you're going to see, they're going to carry all of that off. Uh, and when Ezekiel gets carried off, you know, the treasures of the temple are, all, you know, are, are carried off. And so... Uh, they humbled themselves. God relented of his disaster that he had planned during Hezekiah's time. Only the children of Judah are going to act in such a way that they're going to bring it on during uh, the time of uh, Zedekiah. Um, in, um, in this passage in Leviticus 26, 14 through 39, we don't have time to read it, but there we're warned by Moses warns the people uh, what was going to happen if they turned to idolatry? He basically says, uh, you're going to be carried off into captivity. The children of Israel had already seen that happen. Uh, the children of Judah, the people of Judah, had already seen that happen with their sisters to the north, right? Israel and, and Samaria had been carried off by the Assyrians. Uh, but Moses had warned them in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, the consequences of not keeping the law would be that you would end up in uh, captivity. Well, think about it as a, a person of Israel. Why would that be devastating? I mean, I, I get it that we say, yeah, it's devastating because you're really now a slave and you're going to be suffering. But even beyond that, think about the purposes of God. Why understanding some of these people might have been reluctant to believe the message, why, why, would, they, why would that be devastating to hear, we're going into captivity? What about the promises of God? What did God promise through Abraham? Through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Do you think the children of Judah were very well aware of all the promises of God? They knew it. They knew this. There's going to be, and so kind of put yourself in their shoes a little bit. To think, wait a minute. 
How, how is God going to cast us? He's going to send us into captivity? Has God rejected his promises? And Ezekiel asked that question in verses 9 and 8, some, kind of similar to that. Uh, he's like, God, have you just gotten rid? Have you, you just forgot about the remnant? God's going to answer that, and we'll get to that you know, when we talk about it. But understand, then, maybe we can empathize a little bit with the people of the children of Israel to understand I'm, I'm confused as to what's going on. But the message is, is about repentance, and what they should have been was repentance at the message that Ezekiel's preaching. Aaron. Deuteronomy chapter 21. God talks about the purpose that he set the Israelites there for. He says, I set you among the nations, and I'm going to do these things so that my name will be regarded as holy among the nations. The Israelites, Judah, here, are looking at the promises, but not the purpose. Right. They refuse to serve the purposes of God. They have failed to serve the purposes of God, and they want the promises. And there is a... That is still a lesson today. If we look at God and we expect to receive the promises and we fail to serve God's purpose because our purpose now is the same one that theirs was. They were to be a light among the Gentiles. And that's what he's told us to be. And if we fail to serve the purpose that he's set for us, then we'll also fail to receive the promises. So there are things we can learn, and I appreciate what you said because I think that's right. They failed their purpose. We can learn about that, that we failed our purpose. Real quickly, uh, this is a brief outline of Ezekiel. You can see it, but you had the first 24 chapters are going to be prophecies against Jerusalem. Chapters 25 through 32 are against other nations, and chapters 33 through 48 are about hope after the fall of Jerusalem. So keep that in mind as we go through the book of Ezekiel.